Great Scenes from Great Plays, with your host, Walter Hamden, and starring tonight, Miss Faye Bainter, in The Old Lady Shows Her Medals. On behalf of the families of the Protestant Episcopal Church in your own community and the Episcopal Actors Guild, we welcome you to another half hour of great scenes from great plays, transcribed by famous artists of stage, screen, and radio. And now I present your host, the distinguished actor-manager, Mr. Walter Hampton. Thank you, and good evening. Sir James M. Barry, who wrote The Old Lady Shows Her Medals, spoke to the hearts of men and women, agelessly and unforgettably. His touching story of a London charwoman in the years of the First World War is an enduring testament to faith and courage. And here to play the role of that charwoman, called Mrs. Dowie, I am privileged to present the beloved star of stage and screen, Miss Faye Bainter. Thank you, Walter. Being both an Episcopalian and a member of the Episcopal Actors Guild, I'm delighted to participate in this wonderful series of great scenes from great plays. Faye, I'm sure our audience anticipates hearing this dauntless little play again as much as I do. So let's raise the curtain now on The Old Lady Shows Her Medals, adapted for radio by Philo Higley, and starring Faye Bainter as Mrs. Dowie, with Anthony Ross as Kenneth. <laughs> The mop and pail are Mrs. Dowie's badge of office. And for an aging scrubwoman, life in wartime London can be anything but cosy. All the same, brisk little Mrs. Dowie, who is Scotch by birth, usually contrives a late tea in her basement lodging. Her guests this afternoon are two peppery charwomen friends. If our hostess seems to wear a slightly furtive air when these other ladies proudly hail the exploits of their sons, don't be surprised. There's a reason, and we'll come to it in time. Just a little more cake, Mrs. Haggerty. There's plenty. Oh, it's delicious, but I couldn't, Mrs. Dowie. But if Mrs. Twimley will permit me to continue, there can't ever be so terrible a war again. Why, however could it come about? That's to be seen, Mrs. Haggerty. After all, I guess I know the horrors of this one. Me that has a son a prisoner in Germany... Being the only lady present that has that proud misfortune, I... Oh, as, as if I didn't have a son at Salonaki. And, and, of course, mine is fighting in France. Oh, really, Mrs. Dowie? If you'll excuse me, Mrs. Twimley, the correct pronunciation is Salonaki. I don't think. Uh, and, Mrs. Agarty, I speak is one that owns war saving certificates. We all have them. Well, now, let's speak of something pleasanter. Have you seen this week's fashion chat? Lady Dolly Canister was seen conversing at the Savoy in a dainty smock de joux. Fine. Would I have liked to see her, too? The paper says Lady Dolly is equally popular as maid, wife, and munitions worker. Mm, she'll have the same tremors as the rest of us and be as keen to get those letters wrote in pencil as we are. Them pencil letters. Oh, them poor lads. Oh, I had a letter from my son Percy yesterday. Alfred sent me his photo. Kenneth writes me every week. Oh? Oh, yes, yes. See this packet of letters? All his. Well, of course, my Percy has little time for writing in the artillery, but he always begins, Dear Mother. Kenneth begin, Dearest Mother. Hmm. I haven't known you long enough to know your Kenneth, Mrs. Dowie, but a short man, I'd say, judging by yourself. Short? Six feet two inches, that's all, Mrs. Swimley. Yours. He wears kilties, did you say? No, I did indeed. Uh, and in the famous Black Watch Regiment besides. Well, we can't all be kilties, can we, Mrs. Dowie? That's very true. Wearing ordinary pants must get so dull. Huh. 
Ah, as, uh, as you can at great airy legs, like some of the mother Scottish in their kilts. Airy legs? Tremendous. Oh. Why, Mrs. Dowie, do you see who just come down them steps outside your window? None other than the Reverend Mr. Willings from the Mission Church. The Reverend Willings? No. Oh, my sakes. Why, Reverend Willings, was you calling here? Oh, good afternoon, Mrs. Dowie. How do you do, ladies? Reverend. Oh, sir. Friends, I have news. Oh, news from the front. Not Did... about my Alfred, sir. No, no, all is well. The news is for Mrs. Dowie, and it's good. News for me? Your son, Mrs. Dowie. He has five days' leave. My son? Yes. Oh, mm -hmm. oh you're, you're, you're quite sure, Mr. Wilkes? Oh, quite sure. He has arrived already. Arrived? You, you mean in London? A lucky woman. Ladies, it's quite romantic. I was at church army quarters, and suddenly I saw a Highlander sitting in the corner rather drearily with his kit at his feet. A big man, Mr. Willings. Great brawny fellow. Welcome back to Blighty, I said. Anything I can do for you? He shook his head. What regiment, I asked. Black Watch, 5th Battalion, he said. Name? Dowie, he replied. Kenneth Dowie, I said. I know your mother. And what, what did he say to that? He looked at me as if he thought I'd lost my mind. But I told him how often you spoke of him and said I'd bring him straight to you. Bring him here? You say he's, he's coming here? He has come. He's up there on the street. Oh! I said I'd better break the happy news to you oh, before he... Oh, oh, Mrs. Twimley, look, oh. he is tremendous. Oh, airy late. Kindly get them to go away, Reverend. Uh, uh, of course. Huh? Oh, uh, ladies. Yes, sir. Uh, uh, perhaps we should all let Mrs. Dowie greet her son alone. I wouldn't want company if my Percy had come home. I'll go straight up and send him down. The poor happy thing don't even hear us, sir. Look, she has his letters clutched right in her hand. We're all happy for you, Mrs. Dowie. A good son, writing you so often. Well, yes, I... Well, yes, a good son. A, a good son. Mm. And here he is. Dowie, my friend. She's waiting for you with your letters in her hand. That's great. A happy leave to both of you, then. Well, now, do you recognize your loving son, Mrs... My, I did well to write so often, didn't I? Here, let's see those letters. Open by censor. I'll, I'll, it's nothing but blank paper. Is this your scrawl and pencil on the envelopes? Yes. Y yes, sir. Mm, the minister said you were a charwoman. I, I suppose you picked them up out of trash baskets and then changed the addresses. Ah. Here, don't you dare destroy those letters, Well, Mr. they're not real. They're the best I have. I thought you said you had a son. I never had a husband, nor a son, and anything. What? You see, I call myself Mrs. To... To give me standing in my circle. Oh, the whole thing's beyond me. Come now, what made you do it? It was everybody's war except mine, mister. Everybody's bravery. Uh, I don't follow you. I wanted to show some, too. Kind of a faith in the future, you might call it. Faith? Well, how could a lion deceive an old ragbag like you? Well, that's the end. You, you're not going away already? Aye, of course I'm going. I only come to show you up. I know you only come to show me up, but you could drink a, a bit of tea while you're doing it. Certainly not. There's cakes, too. Oh, cakes, is there? <coughs> no, <coughs> not me. Oh, you're a, a conniver and a cheat, that's what. Uh, now, now, give me the whole story. Well, it's true that my name is Dowie. That's alone's enough to make me change mine, woman. And I've been charring and charring about as far back as I mind. Came here from Scotland over 20 years ago. We'll skip the ancient history. I'll have a date. And then, when I was old, the war broke out. So how do you come into the war? But that's the thing, Mr. Dowie. I didn't come into it. Everybody else seemed to but me. The neighbors shrugged me off. You sure you won't have a cup of tea? No. Now, now how'd you happen to pick on me out of the whole British army? Because maybe I liked you best. What? I read once in the paper... In which action he was assisted by Private Kenneth Dowie, 5th Battalion, Black Watch. <laughs> and you never thought I'd turn up, did you, you conniver? <laughs> I'd begun to be weary for a sight of you, Kenneth. Uh, what, what was that? Oh, uh, mister. 
Oh, dressed just satisfied. Now you see me. Oh, I'm very satisfied. Does your folk live in Scotland? Aye, Glasgow. Both living? Aye. Oh, your mother's terrible proud of you, no doubt. Naturally. You're going to the men? Uh, after I've had a, a skite in London first. Oh, so she's in London, is she? Who? Your young lady. Oh, oh now don't be jealous. She's a young thing. Her beauty, no doubt. Oh, you may be sure. Has a title, too. Equally popular as maid, wife, and munitions worker. Oh, she sent me lots of things. Cakes and a sweater with Cheerio on the cards. Will you try one of my cakes, mister? Uh, no, not me. I'm leaving any moment. My own bacon. Here, try one. All right, sir. So <clears throat> it seems to me I've tasted these before. Yeah, well, maybe I have. Why, that's exactly the cake her ladyship sends me. And how about the sweater? What? I hope the black watch colors pleased you. You've been sending these things. Yes, I have. Oh. Well, I, I, I dare not give my own name. And I was always reading Lady Dolly's in the paper. I said you was conniving, woman. Is there no losing you? All right. Give me some tea. <laughs> oh, glory, glory be. Can it be of a brave sense of you, my lad? <laughs> and, and now, now don't, don't you be thinking, Mrs., that you got me, even if I have been idling with you here an hour or more. Oh, no, no, I would not presume that far, Kenneth. Yeah, uh, that cake was good. Uh, well... I have a theatre tonight, followed by a randy dandy. The chap I met on a bus is going with me. I have already booked the ticket, so... Uh, Ave atque vale. And what does that mean? It means hail and farewell in Greek. Oh, it's a scholar too. Aye. Kenneth, you're a proper man to look at. I'm generally admired. She's an enviable woman, your mother. I have no mother. Nor father either. Uh, that was just protected myself. Is that true? It is. I never even knew their faces. <laughs> well, <clears throat> thank you for my tea. I, I must be stepping. Where are you living? Oh, there's a sort of rest hut where some of my pals are. You know, I I've waited to see London all my life, but, well, I, I changed my mind today. It is a lonely place. I know all about that too, Kenneth. You do? I'm sorry for you, you poor old body, but I, I see no way out for either one of us. Now, no, no where, where is my kit and my bonnet? Kenny, hmm? I've, I've heard the thing a man on leave wants most is a bed with sheets and a bath. You heard a true thing, Mrs. <laughs> Look there in the pantry, Kenny. Lift the dresser top and tell me what you see. Well, it's a kind of a bath. You could do yourself there pretty, huh? Half at a time. Me? No, there's a woman next door would put me up at night. As long as you leave, lass. Oh, is there now? And look, a folding bed right here. Well. <laughs> you thought it was a wardrobe, didn't you? It's not. I say, that, that's a dodge we need in the trenches. Your bed, Kenny, if you'll have it. My, my you queer old cover. Now, now, what would you want with an ox like me about? No, no, it's not to be thought of, thanks. You're very sure? Aye, sorry. Oh, I'm the commonest kind of man. Just a, a kickabout all my life. A drink. Oh, I'm not even any great shakes at the war. You should be brave with the best of them, I know that. Well, I'm no coward. But you don't see me wearing any medals either, do you? Not only because they haven't found the worth of you yet, can they? Ah, Mrs. Twimley. <sighs> it's Mrs. Twimley. Come on in. Oh, no, no, Mrs. D -d -d I see your son's still here, but I thought he'd likely be stepping out tonight. Uh, and so if you'd be lonely, I'd gladly come by. No, I'm sorry. Uh, we thank you for your kindness, Mrs. Twimley, but my mother won't be home tonight. She's going to a theater with me. Kenneth! Well, Kenneth, I'm oh, having Oh, you're a lucky mother, Mrs. Doy. Well, then, I'll, I'll just say good night. Good night, Mrs. Twimley. A theater. Can it be a mean? No, it would be showier if I took a, a lady, wouldn't it? But I haven't a few, I, I, I mean, I, I haven't much that's awfully rich to wear. It's true, you haven't a great deal of style. But wait till you see my black merino. It laces up the back, the latest mode. Have you a bit of chiffon for the neck? Chiffon's what the men think of out there. I have, I swear I have. And a bungle, and a muff, and glue. Well, I don't know, but, but would you see what you can do now? We just might eat a bit somewhere after the show. Oh, no. 
and all, I, I promise nothing, mind you. All will depend on the effect you make. I will try, Kenneth. Now, mind you, I, I don't accept you yet as my relation. You can pretend to your neighbors, but I'm a cautious man. We must wait and see how you'll turn out. Yes, Kenneth. And now I think for that pantry bath. Here, where, where's my blasted kit? Oh, and old lady, before I start, show me once more how I work my bed. Kenneth. Oh, that's a weird and wonderful bed indeed. <laughs> It is a dream of a show indeed. I never saw the chance. <laughs> well, you're as good as the show up there, old lady. <laughs> Kenneth, everything on the bill of fare looked much too dear. After the treat you stood me Tuesday night, we must order up now, old girl. We've only got two days more, you know. <laughs> Do you think of this place? Oh, I... Kenneth, I never dared to guess I'd sit in a fashionable cafe like this. It must be just like Paris. Oh, well, it's near as good. Is my bonnet on straight, Kenneth? Aye. Oh, this is by far the grandest of the spots you've taken me. <laughs> I can just... Kenneth. What, what's the matter? This is the last night. Oh, forget the coachman, Cinderella. Waiter. Mrs. Dowie, I'm about to order us champagne. <gasps> oh. Ah, Mrs. Twimley, a warmish night. Aren't they back yet? No, Mrs. Eggers, I've been waiting here this last half hour. They are at the theatre again. It's amazing, Mrs. Twimley. Amazing, scarce the word. Well, I just popped in with an insignificant little present since Kenneth's leave is up. Mm, that's why I came too. Deary me, five days. It wasn't long. My present's cigarettes. Oh, so's mine. Mine's exquisitos. Oh, indeed. Well, mine has gold tips on them. I bought... Wait, I think I heard a taxi. Oh, oh. Yes, it's them. They're coming down. That makes their third taxi this week. Oh, I get it. We have visitors. Uh, your servant, ladies. Well, we wish you'd apologize, Mrs. Dowie. We're not meaning to stay. You're very welcome, both of you. Just wait till I get off my astrakhan and my muff and my gloves and my new bonnet. Ah, oh, me, you've given her a glory time, Mr. Dowie. It's her that has given it to me, Mrs. Twins. Oh, well, he, he does pamper me. Would you believe it? We had another sit-down supper at a restaurant. And this being his last night, we had champagne wine. No. no. And to uh, them as dopes, my word, here's the cork that I brought home. Oh, the lovely shiny gold of it. Oh, I'm sure we don't grudge you your treats, Mrs. Dowie. And indeed, we're sorry that tonight's the end. Yes, uh, it's, it's the end, all right. Uh, I, I must be off in a few minutes. Oh, oh. oh poor thing. Into the pantry for a bit of a cry, I fancy. I, I kept her out long on purpose so as to leave the less time for goodbyes. Uh, well, we must run to and let you say them. Here, Mr. Dowie, just a mere nothing to wish you well, sir. These two. Smoke up out there and think of us. Oh, your bricks, the pair of you. Oh. <laughs> Good luck, Scotty. And the same to you. And if, if you see a man upstairs in kilts, he's the one that's going back with me. Tell him not to come down, see? Just, just give me a whistle when the time is up. Right now. Goodbye. Well, here we are, old lady. Is, is it time? No, not quite yet. Dixon will whistle at the last minute. I'm... I'm being very careful, you see that. But all's finished, isn't it? Uh, uh, see here now. You promised to be gay. And when I have a leave again... You will come and at least have tea. Of course. Oh, you've given me the time of my life these five days. Spoiling me and feeding me. No. 
It was the time of my life, Kenny. I... I know. It's bad for you, but it's bad for me, and it's even worse for you. The men have medals to win, you see. Aye. But the women ought to have their medals, too. Have you not noticed? You have never called me son. I was feared, Kenneth. You told me I was on probation. Ah, and so you were. <laughs> well, the probation's ended. You went, went, went blasted. You have style. Will I do? Oh, Mrs. Dowie, you queer old snark. <laughs> Have I your permission to ask the most important question an orphan can ask of an old lady? None of your thoughts, no. And if you're not willing to be my mother, I, I swear I'll never ask another. <laughs> I might mention, too, that I've, I've listed your name as my nearest kin. Your allowance will be coming in quite regular while I'm away. Oh, but isn't that wicked, Kenneth? Oh, then, too, in case. And just in case anything should happen. Kenneth! Oh, 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 have no fear. I'll come back. I've covered with modern metals. Uh, mind you, have that cup of tea for me. Uh, and by the way, don't forget to write. Real letters this Aye. time. <laughs> You'll write too, won't you, Ken? Aye, and I hope Lady Dolly will go on sending cakes. For that you may be sure. Oh, no, this scarf of mine, I'm, I'm tired of it. Let's just see how it looks around your neck. Why, it set you fine. Blue was always my color. Oh, but you must... Uh, uh, keep it. You know, you must have been a funny thing when you were young. Oh, away with you. Oh, Ken. Ken, I, I, I didn't... So long. The quicker the better. Hey, old lady. You're what home means to me from now on. You Thank see? Thank you. Thank you, son. I came as soon as I heard. I'm very sorry. Thank you, sir. Bedden action, it says. There's something very final sounding about that. Mrs. Dowie, if there's anything at all that I can do. Thank you, sir. Other people have been learning to go on just the same. I can, too. There's so little one can say. But God gives comfort, Mrs. Dowie. If you seek it. Yes. Yes, I, I know that. And, and I thank you for coming. Sit down, Reverend. Please to excuse the hodgepodge on the table. I was merely looking over my souvenirs, putting them to rights a bit after the message gave. Of course. Nothing very much, I guess. I mean, they wouldn't be to anybody else. But did I ever show you my blue scarf? Kenneth, give me that. Then there's my war certificates, of course, and Kenneth's black watch bonnet. And his letters. He had time to write me quite a few. I see. And, and this? Oh, that's our champagne cork. Real bright, shiny, with the tinsel. I keep them all wrapped in this woolen scarf. They should wear well. They should indeed. He hadn't time to gain his medals. He would have, of course. I know that, sure. Of course. But in a way, you know, these things are your medals. Mine? Yes, your medals, your citations. You've won them, Mrs. Dowie. Thank you for saying that. And do you know, Kenneth himself spoke of it once. He said, women ought to have their medals, too. The 
This is Walter Hamden, ladies and gentlemen. Next week, the Episcopal Actors Guild will present a wonderful play with one of your favorite stars. I'm sure you will enjoy it immensely. I'll tell you more about it in a moment. Right now, I'd like you to hear why we chose the old lady shows her medals for tonight's presentation. Throughout our country and all over the world, there are far too many lonely men and women. Tonight's tender and beautiful play by Sir James M. Barry was chosen to bring to the lonely everywhere new hope and new strength, to give them inspiration and the courage and faith of that grand little lady who showed her medals, Mrs. Dowie. Like many lonely souls, Mrs. Dowie turned to make-believe to find a loved one for whom she could live and make sacrifices. When her imaginary son became a six-foot reality, there was no measuring her joy. And when he was taken away in the war, Mrs. Dowie's grief was great indeed. But still she was ready to go on with her life, brave in the memory of her beloved Kenneth, and in the knowledge that she could find in God and the church the comfort and strength she needed. Ever since its very beginning, the Christian church has provided a sure haven for the lonely, a place in which they could always find sympathy and understanding, both from the clergy and from other church members. Yes, millions of lonely men and women have lost their loneliness in the worship and activities of the church. In fact, many who are listening to this program tonight know from their own experience how much the church and an experienced clergyman have done to make them feel sure that with Christian faith, they are never alone. You can never tell how much you may need the help and strength of the church in the days ahead. So if you're not a member of any church, may we urge you to think carefully about discovering how much more complete and secure your life can be when you have that which only the church has to give. In choosing a church, please bear in mind that you are always welcome as a visitor at your nearest Episcopal church, and that its clergyman is eager to meet and talk with you. But perhaps even before such a visit, you'd like to know a little about the Episcopal church, what it is, what it stands for, and how it offers you a faith to live by in these difficult times. Now, this information is contained in an interesting little booklet called Finding Your Way. It'll be sent to you promptly if you'll simply write your name and address together with the words Finding Your Way on a postcard and mail it to the station to which you are listening. I would like to thank our cast, and especially you, Faye Bainter, and Anthony Ross, for an inspiring performance. Our music was composed and conducted by Nathan Crowell. Next week, friends, we'll present the dramatic and moving story of the young Illinois lawyer who became one of our greatest presidents. It's a play of hope and courage, I'm sure you all remember, young Mr. Lincoln. And the star of our transcribed play will be a man equally at home on radio, stage, or screen, Mr. Henry Fonda. I hope you will join us. Mr. James M. Barry's The Old Lady Shows the Medals is produced through the cooperation of Paramount Pictures. Now an invitation from the church. The rector of your nearest Episcopal church will be happy to have you join his parish family. Why not attend church this coming Sunday and speak to him after the service? If you are not familiar with the location of your nearest Episcopal church or of the hour of service,